The Lord be with you. This is water, by the way. At least that's what Pat told me it was. Um, um, I invite you to turn with me, <clears throat> excuse me, in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 12th chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, we'll be reading verses 1 through 4a there, the first half of verse 4. Genesis chapter 12, beginning verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Great God, as we come now to hear from Scripture, we pray, Lord, you give us ears to hear what you would have us to hear so that we may do what you call us to do that we may be the people that you call us and bless us to be. May your words, Lord, be the ones we hear, while whatever words I manage to put in our way will be quickly forgotten. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, to read the story of God and God's people in Scripture is to read a story with a rocky beginning. Now sure, it sounds lovely in those first two chapters. I mean, God speaking the universe into existence. Let there be light, and there was light, and everything was good. Or that second chapter where God gets God's anthropomorphic hands dirty, playing in the dirt, forming the Adam from the Adama, the man from the dirt. But... A lot, of, a lot of things seem to take a turn. A lot of ink rests on a lot of pages and a lot of books about those first two chapters, to be sure, but it doesn't take long, not long at all, before things start to go off the rails. We saw last week how in the first verses of chapter 3, the story takes a, a dark, more dramatic turn. The woman the Lord had created has a theological debate with a snake, whether she wins or loses depends on how you read the story. But she and her man wind up eating fruit from a tree which the Lord had forbidden them. And their eyes were open. They see their nakedness. They sew some fig leaves together and cover themselves up and they hide. And they hide from God. It's the very moment in the story of God and God's people where the needle scratches on the record, where the brakes squeal almost to a halt, where sin slips so seductively out of the shadow of human will and into the full light of day. And what's the result? What's the result of a cracked creation? What's the sum of sin's arrival into Eden's perfection? Expulsion. Punishment. Curses. The man, the woman, and even the serpent, the snake himself, are cursed by God in chapter 3. You can read the language in verses 14 through 19. The God, Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed you'll be. On your belly you'll go, the dust you'll eat. There'll be enmity, strife between you and the woman and her offspring. And he says to the woman, you, cursed I'll greatly increase your pangs in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. The man doesn't get away with it either. The man, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, because you have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed, God said, is the ground because of you. From dust, God says, you came, and to the dust you shall return. With the arrival of sin, in God's garden came death and punishment and curses. 
Now, you might think, I do, one might think, that such a dramatic turn of events over the consumption of just fruit, over the bite of a piece of fruit, would have some lasting effect on this man and this woman, such an effect that might cause them to remember the Lord's anger, to remember how good it was in Eden, and now God has, has cast us out to remember these things, that they would teach their children the right way. But you don't even have to turn the page. We don't even have to turn the page to see that such a lesson is not so easily transmitted to the next generation. Because in chapter 4 of Genesis, murder makes its way through the cracked door left ajar by that first sin. Cain, in his jealousy, kills his brother Abel. And what's God's response? Curses. God says to Cain, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And I'm afraid it doesn't get much better from there. After, after chapter 5, where we basically just get all them this so-and-so, but got that so-and-so, and lived this many years, in chapter 6, right away, we hear, the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth. And it grieved God to God's heart. We're not even, even in the double digit page numbers in this story. And already God is sorry he ever fooled with the idea in the first place. God is sorry to have ever even thought about creation. If it had been me, you know what I'd have done? I'd have took this little green ball and plucked it into the sun moved Mars a little closer and started over. That's what I'd have done. God's had it to the back teeth with sin and wickedness in the world, the way things seem to have spun out of control and away from what was perhaps God's higher idea. So God has a reset plan. He's going to punish sin, curse those responsible for it in one grand final way. God was going to drown them all. Well, most of them, except for one man and his family and all the critters he could carry in a boat. But even after building an ark, even after surviving a devastating flood, even after witnessing firsthand the enormity of God's power and desire to rid the world of wickedness, after covenanting with God, God's self, right when he steps off of the ark, we're told Noah cuts a covenant with God, builds an altar. But right after... Noah puts things right back in the gutter before the puddles are even dry on the ground. Noah plants a vineyard, makes some wine, gets drunk, and passes out naked. His son sees it. It's a little ambiguous statement in the Bible. Not sure what it might mean altogether, but we know he sees his father's nakedness. And when Noah wakes up, what does he do? Curses. Curses his own grandson, his grandson, not his son, his grandson. It seems humankind cannot shake this cursing and punishment thing because even in chapter 11, all the peoples of the world, having obviously learned nothing from Adam or from Cain or from Noah, they decide, you know what, if Adam and Eve tried to become like God with a piece of fruit, maybe we can become like God by building a tower. And so they all come together to build this obelisk, to reach to the sky. But we're told that when the Lord, when Yahweh catches wind of the scheme, God scatters them across the face of the world and confuses their language, punishes them, curses them, so it won't happen again. Now, I'm not sure what page your Bible's on by now. Mine's barely on page 10. This whole punishment curse way of existence seems to have imprinted itself in the foundational sequences of our human DNA. I mean, think about it. At the first inclination of wrongdoing, many of us are quick to call for punishment, for retribution, for the proper sentence to be handed down. We seem to be hardwired with this retaliatory response, with lightning quick defense mechanisms that allow us to return blow for blow and curse for curse. Why, we even celebrate. We seem to celebrate this way of existence. 
by rejoicing in the news and the failure of a foe. And those who we believe are getting their just desserts. It's about time he deserved that punishment, that curse. Punishment and curses, they seem natural to us. After all, what would the world be, right? What would the world be if the wicked didn't go punished? What would the world be? Who would set sinners straight if it wasn't for curses and punishment? What would the world be like without such things to set sinners straight? Of course, I have to ask the question, do such things really set sinners straight? I wonder, I wonder if perhaps God had such a thought. If such a thought had occurred to God after all this time, because you see, for the first 11 chapters of Genesis, God is pretty handy with this punishment and this curse way of governing uh, creation. However, no matter how many times No matter how many times God curses or punishes, humankind still slinks back into sin. We still find a way to conveniently forget the lessons of our own history. I mean, even a flood, think about this, even a flood that killed everything doesn't do it. So I wonder, I wonder if perhaps God decided to to turn a bit to shift his approach to control over creation. Or maybe, and this is where I tend to be, maybe God had another way in mind all along. You see, by the time we arrive at this part of God's story in the text we've read this morning, we've been through the cycles of curses and punishment enough times to see the pattern. We've seen it. You get the sense that God may be a bit tired of fooling with us fractured folks. That maybe God is ready to throw in the towel. That maybe God is ready to do as I would have done and own into the sun and start over. To leave us to our own destruction. We might be tempted to come to such a conclusion, but that's before we really listen. I mean really listen to these three and a half verses in front of us. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. Make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you. Interesting there, it's just singular. The one who curses you, I will curse. But in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you notice what was different? Do you notice it? This isn't the Eden imperative, a, a restriction followed by a threat. God does not say to Abram, do this or else. God does not say, don't do this while you're doing this. This is not the same. This isn't the Lord who curses the ground, should Abram fail to comply. No, this doesn't even seem to be the God who was sorry for making Abram in the first place. In fact, did you notice there's no mention at all, none whatsoever, of what would happen if Abram didn't go as the Lord had told him? No punishment, no curses. So what's left? Blessing. Blessing. For the first time in the story of God and God's people, we hear that word. Go ahead, look. You're not going to find it before now. For the first time, we hear that word. After generations of punishment and curses that never work, blessing. It's almost, to me, it's almost as if God was through trying out the old-fashioned way and took creation in a new direction. One where curses only come to the one who curses the one who is called to bless. Where, Where people are not threatened with punishment and curses from an angry almighty God, but where they are promised future blessings from the God who calls on human agents to carry out such a blessing. Now, I'll be honest with you. It's a bit messier this way. It is. It's a little more cut and dry for God to say, you know what, you messed up, I'm done with you, let's start over. It's a little messier for God to say, I'm going to bless you. You don't have to read very far after this story. Abram messes it up already, tries to sell his wife twice to save his own skin. Abram's not really nice, takes his own son. We see it as a story of faith, but think about it for a minute. Abram takes his only son up a mountain to kill him because the God who gave it to him told him to. 
Abram doesn't always get it right. Abram's not always there. It's a bit messy. After all, we're still cracked creatures, broken vessels who seem to spend more time searching for our own blessings than we do for the blessings of others. But still, still, it seems to be the way God has ordered things, especially in the light of the text before us. It's blessings, not curses. It's blessings, not punishment. It's a promise for the future, a promise that is only truly fulfilled in an unseen future, which means it's a promise that's bigger than Abram. It's a promise that's bigger than you. It's a promise that's bigger than me. It is a God-sized promise. It's the kind of promise, the kind of blessings that can only truly come from God, even if they may come by way of human agents. In these three and a half verses, God has shifted the entire course of the story. In these three and a half verses, God has shifted, changed the trajectory of the story by abandoning the method of threatening commands laced with curses for the way of blessing. God has focused on a way of blessing that is about action, trust, faith, and the promise of things yet to be seen. But isn't that what this season is about? Isn't that what Lent is? Isn't that what the gospel is about? Aren't we reminded as we draw closer to the cross, closer to Holy Week, closer to Easter's empty tomb, that the God that we worship is a God who has made a way through blessing, a way towards life, a way of hope in the promise of those things yet to be seen? Is not one of the predominant lessons of this season that the cruel curses of punishment and death manifest in Christ's execution on the cross are overcome by the power of his resurrection. It seems to me that this may have been God's way from the beginning, at least the beginning with Abram. It seems to me that we human beings like to seek to right the wrongs of this world on our terms, the wrongs committed against us and our kin, by enforcing punishments we feel fit the crime, or by cursing those who dare step a toe out of line with our definition of what is right, but that just does not seem to be God's way. Of course, the truth is, as long as we have done this, it has never really solved a thing. Punishment and curses have not rid the world of wickedness. Didn't with God's flood, what makes us think we can do it? Punishment and curses have never healed broken relationships or fully restored or rehabilitated a soul. It didn't work with Adam and Eve and their punishment from the garden. It didn't work with Cain's. What makes, it think, what makes us think it'll work with us and our attempts at punishing folks? As one scholar puts it in addressing this text, in short, Curse and punishment have solved nothing. So it's no surprise to me, no surprise at all, that God changes, turns the track in the story with Abram. A track that leads all the way, not just from Abram, but on into Canaan, on into Egypt, into slavery, through Exodus and into the wilderness, through wars, wicked and selfish kings, through division. Exile and dispersion, through occupation and oppression, through a virgin's womb and a feed box baby bed, through the calling of fumbling disciples and the misunderstanding of miracles, through the provoking power of parables and scandalous encounters with those who are unclean, through betrayal, arrest, abandonment, accusation, assault, and even death. No, it's no surprise to me, no surprise whatsoever that God turns the tracks with Abram, that God moves from a God of curse and punishment to a God of promise and blessing. It's no surprise to me, for that is the God that I see. That's the God that I know in Christ Jesus. That's the God I see when I'm tempted to believe in a world that is dark and filled with anger, hatred, and ignorance. And yet still, still, I hear joy in the laughter of a child and witness love in the interaction between total strangers. 
That's the God I see when I am tempted to think the worst of everything, yet God reminds me that I am called to be a part about bringing the best out of everything. That is the God I see when I look upon a cross, a cross meant to curse, a cross meant to punish, a cross meant to put to death. And what I see is a promise and a blessing that fills the world with hope. Let us pray. Eternal God, the one who set the sun on fire and spun the planets into orbit, the one who was there in the garden, the one who scattered our languages, And yet the one who blessed Abram and calls us even now to be blessings ourselves. Remind us, God. Remind us in our failed fallenness. Lord, when we seek retribution, when we seek curses and punishment. Lord, that you call us above it all to be blessings. To bless as you have blessed us. When we wish to seek the worst in everything, remind us, God, that you call us to be blessings that bring out the best in everything. Lord, remind us when it is so tempting to give in to a theology grounded in curses that you give us a calling founded in blessings. Help us, God, as we look this season toward the cross, towards the empty tomb, to be reminded that the power of punishment and the captivity of curses have been broken. And that you, God, bless us and in turn call us as your people to bless all the world. Be with us now, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Show us the way you would have us to go, the move you would have us to make, the life you would have us to live. In your holy name we pray, amen.